We're talking about one of my favorite topics coming up, which is hodling Bitcoin. That's H-O-D-L, HODL. How many people know where the term comes from, HODL? Anybody who knows the story, a famous Reddit post, I am hodling. Why? Because I'm a bad trader. It's hard. People make it seem easy to hodl Bitcoin. Uh, it's not, right? It wasn't too long ago where you go out to dinner and uh, half your Bitcoin position is gone. Uh, so stay strong, hodl, uh, and remember not your keys, not your coins. So next panel is going to talk about this. They're going to tell you how to hodl safely. All right. We've got them coming up here. First up, Mr. Will Cole, Chief Product Officer at Unchained Capital. Our next hodling expert, Alex Dashkolov, CEO at Knox. And finally, another hodler, David Abner, Global Head of at Gemini, Gemini Business <laughs> Development at Gemini. Hodling. Hey guys, thanks for coming. Howdy. Uh, I noticed you both didn't uh, go for the business attire dress code they requested today. Well done. Well yeah. done. It this is the, uh, the Texas business. Yeah, that doesn't, it yeah. didn't really fit the, I noticed business on the agenda, and I, I was thinking that didn't really fit the mandate. But um, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you both made it. Why don't we, uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to introduce myself just briefly. Uh, you know, they, they have our names, but I am the uh, head of business development at Gemini. Uh, I've been at Gemini for only six months, actually. I uh, came out of Wisdom Tree. I spent 11 years uh, at Wisdom Tree and 20 years on the ETF side. Uh, about three years ago, I launched, uh, or my team was uh, responsible for launching one of the first Bitcoin ETFs in Sweden. So I actually could have been on the panel two panels ago. And, uh, but in, in uh, my new world, uh, I care more about actually holding safely. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, Will, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Unchained. Sure. Uh, I'm Will Cole. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Unchained Capital, where we do Bitcoin native financial services, which basically means that uh, we have a relationship with our clients to help them custody in a self-sovereign way. Uh, we do uh, Bitcoin-backed lending. Uh, where we do not rehypothecate collateral, um, and we also do uh, buying of Bitcoin directly into cold storage with keys that you or your business control. Great, thank you very much. And Alex, you want to tell us a little bit about Knox? Yeah, so Alex, CEO at Knox. Um, so Knox, really, our medium-term focus is on solving what we'll call broadly the insurance problem in the space. Um, there's something like $100 billion of Bitcoin held in centralized custody. Generously speaking, maybe 1% of that is insured. Um, and as an industry, we really need to get to the ability, in my belief, to ensure very large sums of uh, Bitcoin held in centralized custody. I know you guys face this problem at Gemini. Um, and our first product really was a custodian that could call itself 100% sort of one-to-one -one insured. Um, that's something we run in Canada um, and looking to expand into a lot of jurisdictions the world o uh, over. That's great. Yeah, we do. Uh, we, it, it is an interesting topic because there's a lot of Bitcoin centrally held. There's very little insurance in the industry. And uh, you know, yeah, we, we want to hear some more details about that. But why don't we start from the very top, right? And we're here to educate people today. So we want to talk about hodling and its difficulty compared to, or custody really, and the difficulty of storing Bitcoin as compared to traditional asset classes, right? Like cash or gold. There's been a lot of conversation today about uh, you know, the evolution of gold. Bitcoin looks a lot like gold, or it looks like a, a new form of, of uh, uh, asset. Why is it either more difficult or less difficult, do you think, than these traditional asset classes to protect it? Well, I think it's much less difficult. Um, traditional asset classes, I think, uh, it, on the problem of custody trend towards centralization. I really think of it in terms of, you know, how do you custody a physical thing? Um, you have security and then you have coercion, right? And how much are you going to spend to secure an asset versus how much does it cost to attack and, you know, infiltrate that security system? That trends towards centralization where you get vaults and, uh, and uh, giant companies that can spend millions of dollars to help you secure something, but you also give up 
uh, sovereignty over that asset in the process of doing so. And uh, that, that's one side of it. The, the Bitcoin side of it, and one of the things I think is such an interesting part of uh, custing Bitcoin is that you can do the same thing. You can get the same security posture for free. Uh, and you can do that yourself. You, you don't have to rely on a counterparty to hodl your Bitcoin safely. You can do this directly from what's available on the protocol for Bitcoin, which is through something like multisig, uh, where you can eliminate single points of failure, and you can do it for a couple hundred bucks and have the exact same security posture that you know, a giant corporation, a, a Coinbase or something like that would have. You can do it personally for yourself or for your business, again, for a couple hundred bucks. Wow. So uh, I want to talk to you more about, about that and like what sizes you would be comfortable with, but let's come back to that in one second. Yeah. Alex, what do you think about storing and maybe even insuring these assets? Why is it more difficult to insure something like a Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly coming off um, from Will's points, I do believe, I can't speak to how difficult it is to hold um, gold or other physical assets, but I think <laughs> Well, we used to watch <laughs> like movies, right? There used to be movies about bank robberies and gold heists, right? All of that stuff is now like, and I think people are translating that into Bitcoin. Yeah, for sure. So, and I, yeah, I think the ability though to remove the single point of failure is really critical. Um, I still do believe for most people that they should be holding their own coins. Um, in many institutional and other cases, that's of course impossible. Um, and that gets us into call it the insurance point. I believe that a well set up custodian like Knox, uh, say running Knox infrastructure is objectively extremely safe. There is a very low likelihood, but it is non-zero, that a theft or a loss can occur. Um, and it's really for that reason that I believe that um, insurance should be brought there. It just needs to be made uh, more accessible in the sense that we need much higher capacities um, and lower premiums. But I think you and I would agree that this is maybe a one, two, three basis point risk at most, um, precisely because there are no single points of failure. So it's interesting. Do you think like this is, um so in traditional finance, and uh, no offense to anybody who may be in the audience, in traditional finance, people thinking about custody is like an afterthought, right? So you, know, the, you don't sit down as an institution uh, that's going to run a long, short equity fund and think uh, deeply about the custody problem. Um, but I feel like the largest custodians in the traditional space are looking at this space and salivating and saying, you're right, there's a trillion dollars being stored either centrally, about you know, one to 200 uh, billion, or you know, a tremendous amount being not centrally stored that they think they can uh, centralize. Is that, uh, is that gonna be a good thing? Do you think the industry's gonna move towards that or away from that over time? I mean, I think the reason that they don't talk about it in traditional finance as much is that they have hundreds of years of history where they've figured a lot of these problems out. They understand deeply counterparty risk and how that works. And uh, there's a lot of laws and regulations built up around you know, controlling who can be a counterparty, what type of regulatory regime you know, uh, is you know, defining what a custodian is. I think that um, with Bitcoin specifically, and institutions, I believe, will follow a very similar path that individuals have, where they start to understand the unique value that Bitcoin gives you with holding keys. Uh, we say this all the time, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. As individuals, I think a lot of us practice that. I think institutions oftentimes will think that it's not really possible for them to do that because of the history they've had in traditional assets. The thing that I think uh, ends up happening there is that they follow a very similar path because Bitcoin is just different. It has a different protocol that allows you to do different things, uh, and it all starts with ownership over private keys. If you do not own the private key, you do not get the full benefits of what Bitcoin's offering you. And in, again, individuals have figured that out, and I believe institutions will follow. I mean, at, at what level, right? So we are, are, obviously Gemini is different, right? We hold sure. keys for our customers. Um, and this is a big argument that's been in the industry for longer than I've been in the industry. It's been going on for years, right? And it's, it may be philosophical as opposed to actually practical, right? There's, there's a, a room full of institutions here, and I get the feeling many of them are scratching their heads going, huh, w we would have to sort of change our entire business in order to control that set of keys ourselves. 
and is, is that practical for our business, right? So what, like, what about the practicalities of that? Why should someone in your mind pursue that? What, like, what are these benefits that you think exist? And at what size, right? Are we talking about a $10 million high net worth account or are we talking about a billion dollar fund and would you feel differently about the two of them? Sure, I mean, to talk about the why, I think you have to talk about what the, what the risks are. Like, what are you actually trying to protect yourself against? And I feel like um, there, are, there are several factors to it, right? There's jurisdictional risks, right? So if you're an individual or an institution, what are the odds or what are the attack vectors in which the regulatory regime that you live under or you operate under uh, is going to be able to you know, get in the way of you doing the transactions you need to do to operate as a business or be an individual, right? So that's one risk. And if you're an institution and you're using a custodian in some sovereign nation or state in the United States, uh, there are ways that those institutions can be pressured uh, based off the regulatory regimes that, that uh, regulate them to not allow you to do the transactions that you want to do. If you're self-sovereign over those funds, then, then of course you can transact, right? Bitcoin allows you to be sovereign and to transact free and clear, um, uh, regardless of the jurisdiction that you're under, if you own the keys yourself, right? Um, there are jurisdictions, you know, countries and states in the United States, like uh, Wyoming, Texas is working on it as well, that are basically trying to sell sovereignty, right? They're trying to sell you on the ability to hold your keys, to do the transactions you need to do as an individual or an institution, and companies and individuals are now shopping around these, uh, these jurisdictions to find right. the places that do it. So that's just one, though. That's just the jurisdictional risk. You have you know, physical key risk of where you put the uh, key. You have um, counterparty risk of who, who actually has the key, whether that's yourself, people in your, cust uh, in your company, or um, you know, if you've given up ownership of the keys, what are they going to do with it, right? Yeah, it's Look, I, I think it's a very interesting topic. I think, uh, obviously, uh, philosophical dis differences in the business, but uh, the industry is growing so much, right? I don't think of us as competitors, but we are all going to grow, and there are going to be lots of different ways to offer these services. So I think it's, it's valuable. It's important for people to understand that, that aspect of it. Uh, thank you. Um, Alex, maybe we'll pivot for a little bit. You pivoted, uh, you pivoted Knox, really, from custody to insurance at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a pivot exactly. So really, our first product was a custody product. That is something that we offer to this day. Um, and the reason for that was to originate the very risk that we wanted to um, kind of look into insuring. So when we first started, we looked at the insurance policies that existed and said, basically, none of these are good enough. Um, either they're too expensive or to the extent that um, you can get somewhat affordable ones, they do not cover all of the risks that we think um, ought to be covered. Um, so that's, that was really step one. And we said, we dream of an insurance policy that can cover against loss, theft from the outside, and theft by internal collusion. And then the really important bit here is that if you're going to cover theft by internal collusion, that it be covered across the entire private key life cycle. So that, I think, was one of the most shocking things when we looked into the policies. And so we said, there's no way you can call yourself insured for collusion if you're not insured for collusion at every step of the private key life cycle. Um, that was kind of the state of affairs at the time. We found the first insurance policy that met all of those properties um, and then started kind of scaling that um, in order to be able to allow other custodians, other FIs, um, and in fact, even other corporations, the same ability to have that um, extreme security with the ability to be insured. Um, and perhaps to Will's point, it'll be interesting to see what happens down the line um, in terms of who is going to be holding keys. Um, if you are, say, some institution that is not a custodian, you know, will you reach out to a custodian um, like Gemini's, or will you perhaps set yourself up with the ability to actually maintain internal private keys? Um, and so that, that will be perhaps an interesting point. And I think that is one of the methods by which we may be able to scale insurance into kind of the levels that we need, is to say, effectively balkanize it, make it so that um, keys are stored by all of these different entities, um, and they can each run their kind of local um, infrastructure. I would imagine there'll be some sort of framework for how keys are stored, and whether it's either via a centralized institution or an individual or an independent, 
And as long as they meet all those criteria, uh, you know, the insurance company should get comfortable with that, right? Is that the way that would work? Yeah, so I mean, I think the insurance companies are getting more and more comfortable with understanding how these systems work. Um, in our case, for example, we can set somebody up with the very same infrastructure that we've deployed. Um, and then ensuring that is very straightforward because if the insurance markets look at it and say, we know this risk, we already are exposed to it um, multiple times over potentially, um, and we'd gladly write a new policy in order to take on more of this risk originated by some other set of people. Got it, got it. So a lot of people ask us in our meetings, right? We meet with institutions and we'll, you know, in the top 10 list of questions is tell us about your insurance, right? And you know, we, we say the same thing, which sounds comical, right? Yeah, we're, we've uh, more than $30 billion uh, worth of Bitcoin or worth of cryptocurrencies under custody, and we have $290 million worth of insurance across our platform. It seems minuscule, right? Do you think that, um, and, and, we have, and we have reasons why that doesn't matter, um, but I, I guess from your perspective or, do you think the insurance companies miss the boat? Like, like we would say, well, you know, we have MPC, we have, uh, you know, gating on asset accounts, and we have a variety of different methods to protect assets because we couldn't get insurance for the last 10 years. Do you think the insurance industry has missed the boat and is now coming around? And do you think that uh, this sort of goal of bringing more insurance, what, like, is that really going to be important over time, or are we just yeah. doing a better job at... So I certainly think it should, yeah. Um, to your earlier point, I've had this argument many times, and I hear people say, well, the systems are extremely safe, right? The likelihood of a theft or loss is basically zero. Um, and when somebody tells me that, I agree, it is true. But if that is true, it is, if it is objectively the case that the risk is near zero, um, that means that there is an insurance product that could, in theory, exist so long as we can actually price the risk. Um, and so that's really the central theme here is, it is possible to do this. Um, the insurance industry, I'm not sure that the insurance industry itself uh, will sort of get around to this, um, but that's why it's on companies like Knox to actually solve this problem. Uh, there are methods by which this can be enabled, um, and I think we will eventually get there. Perhaps a historical note on insurance is, Bitcoin appeared 2009. A few years later, most insurance carriers still do not, did not even know it existed, and companies like Gemini and Coinbase started knocking on their doors in around 2014-15 saying, hey, you know, could you perhaps sell me insurance for this product? Fast forward just five years, um, and now we're in this situation where $100 billion plus is held in centralized custody, and they are nowhere near supplying the capacity necessary. So it's kind of an interesting th thing to see is for the insurance industry, this is the first time that something went from zero to this size um, in so little time. Mm. And I think this is something that you're gonna see replay again and again this century with brand new risk categories. They'll go from not existing to suddenly everyone's you know, foaming at the mouth trying to buy more Got it. of this coverage. Got it. Will, do you think like uh, from a self, you know, from a, you know, controlling your own keys perspective, insurance is more or less important? in that sense, like what? More or less important. Yeah, what's itself? your view on that piece? Of I mean, the idea of in insuring keys and whatever your setup is, right? Um, so it could be that, you know, you could be self-sovereign over your funds, but you could be collaborating with other institutions. And, you know, while that institution might not be able to, you know, unilaterally spend the funds or, you know, you know uh, or lead to loss directly by authoring a transaction, they could end up collaborating with you or with other people in the quorum uh, towards a transaction that wasn't that you didn't mean to do or wasn't authorized. So I do think insurance plays a play uh, can play a role in a self-sovereign setup, just as it does in a fully cu custodial setup. Yeah, can got it around the use of keys. Sorry, around the use of keys. Got yeah. it. Got it. So I guess on this. Um you know, Matt Hogan in the last panel said that uh, really the, the disruptions in the industry are becoming less and less frequent, right? We read less about industry hacks and, I mean, sometimes you'll read about them, but most of the time or almost all of the time now they are not on the regulated exchanges, not with the centralized custodians and things like that. Do you think that, um, and, and really, uh, institutions 
have never been impacted by them, right? The biggest hacks happened years ago. It was not a big institutional market. Institutions, uh, Novogratz said this morning, it's really a six months to a year phenomenon that institutions are coming into this market. Uh, and they, they hear from obviously players like Gemini that say, you know, yeah, we have very little insurance, but you don't really need it because of, and here's why. And they, they see the news that there's very little happening in terms of negative publicity around the industry right now. Do you think there's a uh, false sense of security uh, by newer institutional players about the industry and and then you know the security in this in this business? You, you, I'll, I'll think, toss I think, it up. You guys I can think, both go. I think on. to a certain extent, yes. Right. I mean, it, it depends on it depends on what you're talking about. Like in terms of, there's a lot of financial products out there right now where I don't think people understand the counterparty risk that they're taking, right? When you earn interest on your Bitcoin somewhere, right? Where is that Bitcoin? Who has the keys? What are the, what are the scenarios in which those people can lose the Bitcoin? Because once it's gone, it's gone. And uh, so do you understand your counterparty risk? It, and it, once it's gone, it's gone is true, but there is this concept of your lender or your borrower, you know, having a business behind it that they may have they may have lost the keys, but they still may make you whole, right? And I think that's part of what people are resting on. Sure, yeah. If the company's still around uh, <laughs> in, in the traditional financial markets, what we know of is that uh, the banks that exist in the fiat world, there are bailouts, there are bail-ins. Right. There's someone coming to the rescue. In the Bitcoin world, there's no printing new Bitcoin. When it's gone, it's actually gone. And are you taking that into account to get your two or three percent interest on whatever you're doing to lend out your Bitcoin? Um, I think that there is a miscalculation of risk there. Um, I think that uh, that comes back to who has the keys, actually has the Bitcoin. Do you understand who has the keys to your Bitcoin, contractually your Bitcoin, and what they're doing with it? Alex, what do you think? Yeah, so certainly, I mean, I don't want to see a large-scale loss. It's great that we have not seen, at least amongst the institutional crowd, um, to your point, a lot of, you know, renegade exchanges and such are now where you're seeing um, losses, but we haven't seen, say, a large loss in the institutional space. I do fear one is coming. Um, the way this, these systems work is you have low-frequency, high-severity loss events. Um, I really don't want to see it happen, but I think that you know, I would be surprised if in 10 or 20 years uh, we can sit here and say, yeah, there was never a you know, multi-billion dollar loss um, amongst one of these uh, yeah. kind of institutional custodians. Look, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll back it up with a, with a concrete example. Like uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we do uh, Bitcoin backed loans at Unchained Capital, but we don't rehypothecate the collateral. The reason we do it is the reason you're taking out a loan against your Bitcoin is because you presumably don't want to sell it, right? And when you don't rehypothecate, then we store the funds in a multi-sig address. It's boring, it's simple, and, uh, and maybe you pay a little bit of a higher interest rate on the actual loan itself, yeah. but it's not being sold out, uh, lent out to other market makers and traders and uh, on an unsecured basis where a, a potential for losses is, is, is huge there. It's almost guaranteed given enough time. Huh. Well, guys, look, uh, we're encroaching on the next panel. Uh, I, we could talk for another hour. I have a lot more questions for you. Maybe we'll get another chance in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.